now <coughs> we'll get going. Um, <coughs> this is where we finished after our foreshortened lecture yesterday, uh, when we had a real fire <coughs> drill as opposed to a test at an inopportune time. Um, we're just getting into thermal uh, properties of matter now, all right? So we're going to focus on a whole range of things that I already outlined um, at the beginning of this, this sort of major section. And the first one has to be defining some basic terms. And the first of these is temperature. And there's, there's actually a lot of confusion, uh, at least in the general population, about what temperature is, what heat is. Uh, you know, people talk about heat in a, as a number of degrees centigrade, for instance, which is complete nonsense, right, as we'll see. You cannot talk about heat as a temperature. A temperature is a temperature, and a temperature is a measure of the degree of hotness of, of a material, right? So it relates to the kinetic energy <coughs> and the potential energy of all the particles, atoms, molecules, whatever, that make up that material. Okay? And we define, as we'll see, we define the scale that we use, the measuring device that we use to determine a number associated with that temperature. But at its physical heart, it's associated with <coughs> energy um, uh, internal to the material. Um, and heat, then, is simply the transfer of some of that energy from one material to another, or one part of a material to another. Heat is a transfer of energy, and that's all it is. <coughs> you cannot isolate heat <coughs> as a separate entity. Heat is merely the transfer of energy. So that's why this tongue-twisting phrase, degree of hotness, has to come in when we talk about temperature. We are not talking about heat we are talking about something rather different as physicists. We're talking about <coughs> internal energy. Um, and we'll always get, we'll come to this, uh, you'll come to this in, in a lot more detail later on, but you know, basic part of thermodynamics uh, is that heat energy is always transferred from uh, a hotter object to a cooler object. So an object with a higher degree of hotness to an object with a lower degree of hotness. There is no heat in the opposite direction. Right? We are talking about a net transfer of energy here. Right? So the net transfer of energy is always going to be from the hotter object to the cooler object. <coughs> so one's going to lose energy, the other's going to gain it. All right, now, I've already said what internal energy is. It's down here in text, uh, just uh, in case uh, you, know, you need it written down clearly. Um, but the point of this slide really is more to emphasize the fact that we can't uniquely measure the internal energy of a given object. So we have no absolute scale for the internal energy. We'd have to measure the kinetic and the potential energy of every particle in the material. Right, independently at the same time. Uh, and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, if nothing else, will prevent us from doing <coughs> that uh, with precision. So what do we do? We talk about changes in internal energy instead, because that's associated with heat. Right? It's the flow in or the flow out of energy. And we can measure those things. We can measure the transfer of energy, that's, that's fine. So actually that's what we base all of this stuff on. And we talk about a change of internal energy uh, being uh, um, the heat that is transferred. So it's going to be transferred, remember, from a hotter object to a cooler object, plus whatever work that you had to do to achieve that transfer. Right? In some cases there is no work done. So if you just got a hot object in contact with a cool object, the heat energy is going to transfer from one to the other without anything happening. But in a fridge or a freezer, you can appreciate uh, that there's actually a lot of work done in order to make changes uh, of internal energy. <coughs> the internal energy of the contents of your fridge is going down. The internal energy of the room in which the fridge sits is going up. 
and there's a compressor and all sorts of other stuff happening in between. So there is work being done in that case. So the change of internal energy then is given by um, heat transferred and work done, as in that equation. And that actually forms the first <coughs> law of thermodynamics. As I say, you'll pick this up in more detail uh, later on. All right, so we get two objects and we put them in thermal contact with one another. Thermal contact just means that they are uh, um, in relationships such that uh, energy can flow from one to the other. Okay, it's a fairly self-evident term, I think. Uh, so if we're not doing any work on the object, um, so this is just you falling into the fish pond, all right? Hotter object into a cooler object. <coughs> Uh, the heat is coming out of your uh, warmer body into the cooler water. Um, and that transfer will continue until uh, the two bodies are at the same temperature. Okay, and when that's the case, then we talk about those two bodies as being in thermal equilibrium. In other words, now there is no net transfer of energy. Right? So there is no heat flow, in other words, in that system. They both still have a temperature. The temperature is now the same in both cases, the degree of hotness. But there is no heat associated with that system because there is no transfer of internal energy. Okay, now, next thing we need to do is define a measurement scale for our degree of hotness. And this is up to us, right? This is entirely our invention. Just like defining the meter and the kilogram, this is entirely in our hands. <coughs> it is just a way of measuring this stuff. We can do it whatever way we like, but I'm going to tell you about some um, relatively common scales. <coughs> right? So we're not going to go into some of the more esoteric historical ones, there are lots of them actually, but just um, three principal ones. Um, and this has been done consistently by a really straightforward method, which is to pick a couple of um, physical states of matter that we can reproduce easily and regard those as fixed points. And then essentially we just draw a line between the two. Um, now, do I have any chalk? Forgive me. Bear with me just a second. I didn't restart. There we are. But <coughs> I see this is a... Um, Tuesdays have become an honorary Monday for me, I think, this week. <laughs> There's just so much going on. Okay, so what can we use in terms of thermometric properties? Uh, there are lots of things. I mean, we can use length, right? Uh, a length of wire will expand when you heat it up. We talked about that actually in terms of uh, interatomic forces, if you remember. Um, or in terms of this mercury thermometer or, or an alcohol thermometer, both very, very common uh, in labs. Um, you know, it's the length of the column of that liquid in, in the thermometer tube uh, as the temperature changes. Um, electrical resistance in a wire generally goes up with temperature. And actually, there are some really quite precise thermometers based on measuring the resistance of uh, a calibrated piece of wire. Um, we can use pressure. For a given mass of gas in a fixed volume, the pressure goes up as the temperature goes up. All right, happens to your car tyres, for instance, between summer and winter. It's a relatively fixed volume. Most tyres are now steel banded, they don't expand a great deal. Uh, so if the temperature goes up between January and July, nothing else has changed, the pressure in the tyre will have gone up also. <coughs> um, we can use voltage. <coughs> right? A thermocouple would give you a measure of temperature and I um, think, yes I did, I brought a commercial one in. This is the thermocouple that came out of an old fridge that I repaired, right, this broke so I pulled this out and put a new one in, it's a lot cheaper than buying a new fridge and I am that sort of person um, 
but this tip is temperature sensitive and it's producing a voltage as a function of the temperature in the fridge right? and the unit at the end here is measuring that and deciding whether to close a relay or open it turn the compressor on or off depending on what that temperature is right? and we can adjust that right? this is just the um, setting that's you know a standard button on the inside of the fridge so these things are really really common Right, electrical heaters in hot water systems and so on will all have this sort of device uh, within them. Um, as we'll see, you can make thermocouples out of all sorts of stuff. This is one I did for a student demonstration. I'll try and do this stuff with you at some stage if we can get the time because it's good fun. Um, but you know, all we need is is some dissimilar metals. So the end pieces of this are some copper cables stripped out of a mains cable. And the bit in between is the sort of plastic coated wire you buy from garden centres for tying things up in the garden. And we actually, within one and a half degrees, I think, this crude thing managed to measure the boiling temperature of liquid nitrogen um, really very well in the lab. So you can, you know, you make your own desert island electrical thermometer if you need to. Um, we can use radiation. Things give off light when they're heated up, right? We're familiar that heating up a metal object, for instance, uh, will begin to take it into a sort of dull red glow, orange, yellow, and eventually it will glow white hot. It's giving off light. And we can use that light as a, as a means of measuring the temperature uh, of the object. This is a standard process um, when running furnaces, for instance. There will be a small hole through the door of the furnace through which you can look at the light coming out and determine the temperature inside. You have to have a contactless system of that sort because obviously any thermometer you stick in there is likely to melt or at the very least corrode. <coughs> okay? So there's lots of ways of doing this, lots of properties, lots of systems and I'll, I'll, I'll run through some of those as we get through. So these are the temperature scales I'm going to focus on. <coughs> um, We'll talk about centigrade because it's the easiest way of introducing the basic um, equation. Uh, and it's you know, a fairly classic one. It's, it's based, as I suggested on the blackboard, uh, on the melting temperature of ice and the boiling temperature of, of, of water. Uh, and we've chopped up what's in between into 100 divisions. Um, Celsius is a very, very similar scale uh, but it's not actually defined from the same fixed points. The Celsius scale is actually defined from the next one down, the third in our list, uh, the Kelvin or thermodynamic scale. Um, that's the one that is the reference for everything else because it's based on really fundamental immutable uh, laws of, of physics. The rest essentially get calibrated to that. And the Celsius <coughs> scale is actually defined directly from the thermodynamic scale. Um, so, you know, when a lot of weather forecasters talk about their predicted temperatures in terms of degrees Celsius, it's unlikely that they will have been using uh, one of those <coughs> gas thermometers that I'm going to tell you about later on to do their measurements. It's more likely they're using something calibrated against one of those and it's probably more accurate to talk about degrees centigrade, therefore, than degrees Celsius. But it's a, we're splitting hairs. Um, the two are very, very similar. So here's our basic equation. <coughs> this is how it uh, breaks down. Um, and it's relatively easy, I think, to uh, talk through this. Uh, we've got our two fixed points measuring this thermometric property. All right, one, um, this is, remember, the centigrade scale. So we have chosen 100 divisions as the basic unit of our scale. So this is our thermometric property at the melting temperature of ice. We've chosen that to be zero on our scale, hence the subscript. This is the thermometric property at the boiling point of water, which we have chosen, remember, to make 100 degrees. 
a hundred divisions at the scale. Um, so the bottom line of our fraction then is <coughs> this length. Yeah? Or rather that length. Equivalently. So this is a measure of the variation in our thermoelectric property for 100 degrees, 100 divisions along the scale. So 100 over that is giving us our scale, essentially. This is just how far away are we at our unknown temperature from the beginning of that scale. Yeah? So that's, telling, that's asking us how far up this line are we from this point as a fraction of the whole thing. And the whole thing is 100 divisions. So that's what the equation does. Now you can rearrange this if you've got a mind to do it. It won't take you very long. And just prove to yourself this is the equation of a straight line. Just written in a slightly different way. Right. Classic way for writing an equation of a straight line. is y equals the gradient times x plus a constant, the intercept on the line. All right, now if you rearrange this, so that and that are going to be your two variables, y or x. You can make your own decision which you want to, want to do. And it's just a matter of rearranging the fraction now, and you will find that you will get something that looks like that. All right? Bearing in mind that this, 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 and this are all constants. They're all fixed. These, by definition, are our fixed <coughs> points. Yeah? So you might want to do that sometime, just for fun, just to convince yourself this really is a description of a straight line. It's just been written in a slightly different way. To make explicit where these numbers are actually coming from. So, this is the length of the column of mercury in a mercury thermometer. It's the resistance of a piece of wire. It's the pressure of a gas. It's the voltage coming out of one of these thermocouples. Whatever that is, as a thermoelectric property, uh, we can use it in order to determine a temperature in degrees, uh, degrees centigrade. Right, so moving on, this is... This is as I said, this is the key scale. This is our um, benchmark for everything else. Um, the Kelvin scale, um, well, some people will call it a thermodynamic scale. Some people, some textbooks will refer to it as an absolute scale. They're all synonymous. They're all talking about the same thing. Um, it's based on thermodynamic principles. Uh, and one of the fixed points on this scale is absolute zero. It is the temperature at which all internal energy from a system has been removed. All right, now if you think in terms of a gas, not that we can actually get a gas precisely to absolute zero, uh, we're talking about something that's now exerting no pressure because nothing's moving. There's no kinetic energy left. All right, so there's no gas uh, atoms or molecules bouncing on the walls of the chamber, which is pressure, right? Um, so absolute zero is defined when there is no internal energy of the system. That is most definitely a solid fixed point. Um, the other one is uh, actually not taking um, ice point or boiling point of water in a sort of naive way again but actually something a teeny bit more sophisticated, something called the triple point. Now, you remember when we looked at states of matter um, a couple of weeks ago, and we looked at phase diagrams, I pointed out on a diagram uh, the concept of a triple point. Right? It's, it's a combination of temperature and pressure, where in water, for instance, we have ice, water, and steam all coexisting in the same container at the same time. All right? We can't do that, obviously, just as a function of temperature. But if we apply some pressure as well, then we can achieve that. 
So this is a really <coughs> tightly constrained fixed point. Yeah? Is there an absolute maximum temperature? Like, if you took all the energy in the universe and that was converted into heat energy, what would that be? Or whether there'd be a temperature so hot that matter could actually hold itself together and fall apart into the quark? Well, I guess what you're doing is talking yourself backwards towards the Big Bang, aren't you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So that's a yes, but don't ask me to put a number on it. <laughs> um, so conceptually, yes. All right. in, in practice, I'm not sure it's actually terribly meaningful because it becomes really quite difficult to measure what you mean by temperature at that, uh, at that point. Um, interesting question, then. So again, just as with all the other scales, we get to choose how many divisions we're going to chop up between absolute zero and the triple point of water. It's our choice. This is our measurement scale. Okay? So, the decision was taken um, that the triple point of water <coughs> would be defined as being at 273.16 degrees Kelvin. And there's a canny reason for doing that. It means that uh, we end up with a neat hundred divisions then between the ice point of water, not the triple point, but the ice point of water and the boiling point of water. So we get this very neat correspondence to our classic centigrade measuring scale. Okay? So essentially this was how many divisions do we have to put in below the triple point of water in order that we can have a hundred divisions between the melting temperature of ice and the boiling point of water. It was that straightforward. So that is why 273.16 is the number <coughs> that it is. That's what you needed to do to get the result that was, that was desired at the other end. Now remember this, um, this number, 273.16, <coughs> is absolute zero to the triple point of water. Our centigrade scale, you remember, was between the ice point and the steam point, not the triple point and the steam point. So that explains the fact that the ice point of water is not at 273.16, it's actually 273.15. There's a hundredth of a degree difference between the two. Is there a specific thermoelectric property that the Kelvin scale is meant against? Yes, pressure of gas. We'll, we'll, I'll tell you about gas thermometers in a little while. Um, whether we get to it today or not, I can't promise, but it'll, it's coming up. And that is, that's our benchmark thermometer, essentially. Um, yeah, so there we are. That's the reason the numbers were chosen the way they were. To give us something that <coughs> had some familiarity to what we were already used to uh, as a temperature scale. Okay, right, sorry, it's sooner than I thought. So yes, you will get your gas thermometer now, uh, as opposed to later. Um, what we need is uh, something that at least gets close to absolute zero as a thermometric property. Um, so if we take a constant mass of gas, right? so we're not allowing gas molecules in or out, uh, that's obviously quite important, uh, and we keep a constant volume, or we keep a constant pressure, either one, we can make it work, but let's assume we've got a constant volume for now, um, then the pressure of the gas will vary with temperature, with its degree of hotness. Now physically, as we'll see later on when we get to the kinetic theory of gases, pressure is simply associated with gas molecules hitting the sides of the container that the gas is in. Right? So a balloon stays inflated because there are gas molecules hitting the inside of the balloon uh, frequently enough and with enough energy to keep the rubber expanded. That is the physical basis of gas pressure. Um, it is just collisions of gas molecules with the container walls. Um, now, if we're taking internal energy out of the gas, that kinetic energy is going to reduce. So the pressure reduces. There aren't the same energy of collisions with the container anymore that, uh, that there were originally. So we can use a gas 
to track back through this temperature range uh, absolutely uh, precisely. And again, we have a we can <coughs> come at this from a slightly different way later on, but this is going to become a very important relationship to us. That if we multiply the pressure of a gas by its volume, that's always proportional to temperature. Yeah. So this is a straight line relationship. This is precisely what we needed for our master scale uh, of temperature. So we get a relationship now. This is this is actually this is exactly the same. And again, you might want to think about this. Um, Precisely the same as our equation for centigrade, right? But rewritten. Why is it rewritten in the way that it is? Well, we don't have 100 divisions anymore. We've got to think about 273.16. Remember. But critically, we've got our thermometric property, which here I've written as pressure times volume, so something that's proportional to temperature. Um, so that's the equivalent of that, pressure times volume at whatever temperature we're trying to measure, T. Yeah? Minus what? The thermometric property, pressure times volume at absolute zero. Oh, pressure is zero at absolute zero. So this term actually disappears altogether, which means, of course, that that one does as well. And this <coughs> now is just pressure times volume at our fixed point, our high fixed point, which happens on this, on this scale to be the triple point of water. Yeah? So it's exactly the same <coughs> exceptional equation. It's just that we've written it in terms of pressure times volume as our thermometric property. And we've been able to get rid of these two terms because they are zero on this scale, and we had to change this number, the number of divisions, from 100 to 273.16. Right? So it's the same mathematical form uh, we've just written explicitly now uh, for, uh, for this type of thermometer. Um, and our Celsius scale, as I said earlier on, gets defined from the thermodynamic scale. It doesn't have its own separate existence, as it were. So if you want degrees Celsius, you have to take the absolute temperature and take off it 273.15. Right, we, we need to move to the ice point, the melting temperature of ice now, not the triple point, remember. So it's 0 0.15, not 0 0.16. Okay, so Celsius is, is defined in this very, very straightforward way. Take off 273.15 from the absolute temperature. So it doesn't have its own fixed points. It's not a separate scale in the way the centigrade scale was. It is derived from the thermodynamic scale. Uh, but, you know, as I say, to all intents and purposes, on a daily basis, because we've chosen the numbers the way we have, uh, our 0 and 100 correspond to the sorts of, same sorts of things that we were talking about with the centigrade scale originally. Yeah? Excuse me. Right, now on this next slide is essentially what I tried to do in a crude way up here. So I'm not going to talk through this uh, in great detail. <coughs> it's simply using this sort of transmutation, if you like, to go from <coughs> excuse me, our standard um, centigrade scale through putting in pressure times volume and then we get down to this Celsius temperature, sorry, at the, at the bottom here. 